Hello everyone, this is Mark Bangert, and uh, it's my privilege today to introduce Bach's cantata number 106, Gottest Zeit is die allerbeste Zeit. This is an unusual cantata in the sense that uh, it has been part of the performing tradition uh, almost uh, since it was written. And uh, that, that makes it quite different from other cantatas. Uh, most of the cantatas, uh, we work with uh, autograph scores or copy parts that were done by known copyists um, or otherwise uh, they are able to discover uh, when the uh, particular cantata was written by virtue of the watermarks that were on the paper that was used. But this cantata does not have any kind of autographs uh, score, nor does it have any existing parts that might have been made by one of Bach's usual copyists. So it, is, it does present kind of a, a difficult problem to figure out uh, its origins. And a good part of the scholarship on this cantata has uh, been, been uh, dedicated to discovering its origins and particularly the, the consequences and the circumstances uh, that caused it to be written in the first place. The first score that we have for it, or that scholars have for it, dates to about 1768. And it is a score that was copied by an unknown uh, church musician, presumably, and it was copied from what we don't know what. It could have been copied from the original score. It could have been copied from another copy. But that's the earliest score we have, and uh, it has some uh, accompanying instrumental parts and voice parts, uh, but they all date from about the same time. This particular score also has as a subtitle uh, to the cantata, Actus Tragicus, those two Latin words which mean tragic drama. Whether that those two words were appended by Bach when he originally wrote this work uh, is unknown. They may have been put there somewhat later, but they have stuck with the cantata ever since. And they were a particular uh, value to people who listened to the cantata and performed it uh, during the years of music, uh, musical romanticism, 19th century. Uh, this fit uh, their notions of death and how we deal with death. The stylistic characteristics of this cantata uh, strike scholars as being close to um, the time that uh, Bach may have been in Arnstadt, one of the first places where he worked, or uh, following that Mühlhausen. Uh, the characteristics uh, that they look at indicate that he's using tools and using techniques that are just being now polished, their, their early attempts at doing things. And it seems that uh, the cantata falls into uh, that group of early works, probably about a half dozen of them, uh, that predate his time at Weimar. Mühlhausen is an interesting place. And uh, Bach spent just a little bit over a year of his early life there. In fact, he was about 21 to 22 years old when he lived in Mühlhausen. Mühlhausen was not far from Leipzig. It was in the center of Thuringia, and it was a free imperial city, which is uh, somewhat interesting because for the rest of his life, Bach seemed to have worked or been connected with uh, free imperial cities, uh, such as Leipzig, uh, Mühlhausen, and then when he studied with uh, uh, Dietrich Buxtehude in Lübeck, that too was a free imperial city. So he um, had lots of experience with living in these rather cosmopolitan places. 
Um, Mühlhausen had two major churches. One was St. Mary's and uh, the other one was uh, known as D.V. Blasi, which means uh, of the solemn St. Blasius. And uh, that's otherwise known in English as St. Blaise, who was known as the healer of throats. Um, D.V. Blasius, the church itself is still stands, has two identical towers and is quite imposing in the city. St. Mary's at the time of Bach was already a Lutheran parish, although you can gather from its name that uh, it began as a Roman Catholic parish. Um, the, uh, the city also had a Latin school, which meant that it had uh, the choir boys, and the choir boys uh, had, had duties at both the chief churches, but also elsewhere. Um, Bach's official responsibilities there in Mühlhausen uh, had to do with playing the organ at St. Blasius. Uh, he had no responsibilities over against the choir, although he was uh, anxious to get his hands on choirs and to begin to uh, see what he could do uh, with those musical ensembles. While in Mühlhausen, the consistory there at the church uh, deemed it uh, possible and deemed him capable of uh, preparing a sketch to redesign and rebuild the organ there. Interestingly enough, he left early enough in his career, that is about 10 months later, that the organ was never built. But the design uh, shows that he was very capable of at uh, organ building and knowing the ins and outs of what made organs work. Um, these days at St. Blasius, if you go there, uh, they've taken those specifications and uh, they've built an organ according to those specifications. And that's the organ that now serves that particular church. The pastor at St. Blasius went by the name of Jakob Frona and he was a superintendent in the, of all of the churches in the city. And the pastor that was uh, uh, responsible for the parish at St. Mary's, uh, his name was Eilmar. And Bach was uh, a good friend of Eilmar's and spent a lot of time with him. And it caused just a little bit of friction between uh, his pastor at St. Blasius and the pastor Eilmar at St. Mary's. So there's a little bit of uh, undercurrent that goes on in his life uh, there at those two churches. He was at a while in Mühlhausen at the age of 21 and getting into 22. Uh, he was dating Maria Barbara, uh, who turned out to be his first wife. In fact, uh, they were married not far from Mühlhausen in a uh, rural church. From what we know, he was highly regarded in Mühlhausen, and that was a great contrast to his experiences in Arnstadt, which is where he came from uh, to go to Mühlhausen. In Arnstadt, he was always getting into trouble. He was a college-age uh, student. Uh, well, he wasn't a student, but he was an organist at that point, but he was college-age and uh, he had a temper apparently, and, and he was always in trouble with the consistory. So it was in uh, Arnstadt that the consistory, consistory uh, reprimanded him for playing the, uh, the hymns that they were to sing on Sundays, playing them in such a way that they were unable to sing them. Uh, he got into trouble with a local bassoonist whose name was Geiersbach, uh, because they made fun of each other. And the story is that Bach drew a sword one night when he was walking home. It's actually probably just a kind of a tiny dagger. Uh, but he was hauled out uh, for um, reprimands in front of the consistory for all of that as well. So he was constantly in trouble there. And uh, it was like a, like a young man who was trying to figure out who he was going to be uh, and how he was going to develop. 
It was also um, at Armstadt that uh, he convinced the consistory that he was going to take uh, four weeks off to uh, go to Lübeck in northern Germany to study with Dietrich Buxtehude, who had quite a reputation across Europe. So he convinced the consistory to, the consistory to do that, and uh, instead of staying away just for four weeks, he stayed away for four months and came back to a pretty unhappy city council, as you might, exam uh, might expect. This was uh, between the years 1705 and 1706, and he went to Mühlhausen then in 1707. So coming to Mühlhausen, he had just had within a year, a little bit more than a year, his wonderful experience with Dietrich Buxtehude in Liebeck, as we said before, another free imperial city. And uh, so the difference between Arnstadt and Mühlhausen were quite significant in his life. Now what we'd like to do now is if my assistant would uh, get up on the screen for you uh, kind of a sketch of the structure of the cantata. We want to take a look at that structure and uh, see how it's put together and see if there's some clues there as to the origin, its origin, and uh, how it came to be. So if you take a look at uh, the structure of the cantata, the first thing that you notice is that the text of it is a series of um, uh, Bible passages seemingly having little to do with each other until you read them all together. Uh, but there, it's just a string of, of Bible passages, one after another. Uh, this is quite different than most of his cantatas, uh, most of his mature cantatas, uh, which uh, use a great deal of poetry. Uh, there's no poetry here at all. It's just simply uh, uh, quotes from, from the scriptures. The uh, second thing that uh, you'll notice about it is that there are four parts to the cantata. Uh, there's an opening sinfonia, and uh, we'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then comes a movement which is number two, but there's two A, two B, two C, two D. And then there's a movement three, which has three A and three B. And then there's movement four. These movements in the middle there, two and three, are unusual. Uh, the only other time that you see Bach number movements like this is in several of his secular cantatas, uh, which have sort of like uh, opera-like librettos, or in the Passions, uh, or in something like the Christmas Oratorio. So this is an unusual format, you know, this multi-part uh, movements uh, that he's, he's put together here. And uh, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, the Sinfonia is unusual because uh, later in his career, I think it's probably uh, three or four years into Leipzig, his Leipzig tenure, uh, he did uh, use Sinfonias again at the beginnings of cantatas. But there's this large period in between uh, where symphonias just don't show up at all. Uh, the opening of the cantata is generally just a chorus, uh, or in some cases, uh, an aria or something like that. But the symphonias uh, were typical of some of the later cantatas, but also these early cantatas, like 106, and another one that comes from the same time as one that uh, you probably know, uh, cantata number four, Christlag and Todesbanden, that also begins with a sinfonia. So the sinfonia beginning thing is a characteristic of a time period here, which is somewhat compressed, but uh, is, is quite significant. Um, so if you look at the text, what is the message? Uh, you might want to take a look at the uh, program uh, to see how it unfolds. But basically, the message of the text is about death. And um, it, uh, the message is, first of all, that death is universal. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 2A and 2B uh, put death as part of all creation. Uh, every, everything that moves and, and uh, breathes is, is a subject to death. And uh, human beings are no different in that respect uh, from plants or animals. So death is universal. The text also uh, stresses the moment of death. It spends a lot of time with uh, the actual act of dying. Uh, not death as a kind of a concept, but death as a happening. And uh, as a matter of fact, Bach will uh, spend some time trying to to describe that moment musically. I'll take a look at that later as well. But death as presented there is mitigated by the presence of Christ. Uh, so at this point already, textually, Bach is thinking very Christological. Uh, Christ makes a peaceful death possible. And because that's the case, it's a cause for rejoicing. Some commentators have pointed out the fact that um, those two middle sections of the cantata, movements two, uh, together with A, B, C, and D, uh, and movement three, uh, A and B, uh, are really contrasting sections so that movement two is really, in theological sense, the law. Uh, that is, sin as a consequence uh, or death as a consequence of sin. Uh, and that movement three is, is the gospel at work. Uh, that is God's activity in Jesus Christ uh, making it possible for, uh, for us to be released from death. At any rate, as you look at all of the texts that are put together there, the general impression is that this looks like funeral music which is, I suppose, why the words Actus Tragicus uh, stuck with the cantata for so long. The scoring of the cantata is also somewhat fascinating. Uh, he uses um, uh, four instruments that were on their way out, as it were. Uh, they were becoming less and less popular as they were being replaced by more modern versions. One being the flauto dolce, um, which means a, a sweet flute, as opposed, I guess, to a transverse flute, which is unsweet. Uh, but the, the, the dolce uh, flauto is um, equivalent to what we know as recorders today. That is, the, the flute is played from one end of the tube and is not played sideways like this, but played this way. So there are two of those uh, recorder-like flutes. And then there are two violas de gamba, uh, which are oversized violas uh, that needed to be, be played between the knees, hence gamba, because that's what the Italian word gamba means. Uh, and they're not quite the size of a cello yet, but they're kind of growing up to be a cello. And uh, they are, I think, basically fretted instruments. Um, so they have a wonderful sound, uh, and it's kind of haunting. And you put together two violas da gambas and these sweet flutes, and you've got some interesting scoring. Underneath that is a continual line. Uh, which uh, is, consists of keyboard and cello and uh, possibly here and there contrabass. But it's an intimate concept is uh, where I was going with this. Uh, the whole notion of the cantata is it's a very intimate group, uh, both of the, the violas de gamba and the sweet flutes are not loud instruments. They are meant for chamber usage. And so the whole cantata is sort of conceived as something that's to be done in a smaller space uh, with, with uh, not a lot of voices, uh, while there's indication in the score that uh, a choir is used. It's a, probably a choir of no more than three voices per part. And these were probably uh, uh, students from the Latin school. 
So that, that intimate kind of sound and that quiet, soft sound also uh, helps to support the notion of this being funeral music. Uh, because nobody plays trumpets at funerals. Uh, you have a kind of a, a quiet time in respect for the people who are mourning. But if it's funeral music, the question is, whose funeral was it for? And that's uh, a question that has been um, plaguing scholars ever since they began to look at this cantata seriously. And as a matter of fact, that uh, kind of serious looking at the cantata, this particular one, uh, was going on uh, very early on, probably even before Bach's death. So um, they were uh, wondering whose funeral this was for. There's no indication anywhere at St. Blasius in the church records. Uh, there's no indication on the scores that we have uh, for, for, that it was for someone's funeral. In fact, it's not even sure whether Bach wrote this while he was in Mühlhausen. He could have written it another time, and I'm going to propose that in uh, just a second. So um, one answer to that question about whose funeral uh, it was is an answer that was proposed early on. And uh, they discovered that uh, Bach's uncle, whose name was Tobias Lummerhurt, uh, his uncle is his mother's brother. Uh, Tobias Lummerhurt died on August 10th, 1707. This would have been shortly after Bach arrived in Mühlhausen. It's a proposal that has long been held, and uh, while there's nothing to discredit it, uh, there's nothing to support it as well. So it's just out there. It's uh, supported a little bit by the fact that his uncle, Tobias, left uh, Sebastian uh, 50 florin uh, in his estate. And uh, that was no small amount of money. Uh, and since Bach was uh, heavily dating Maria Barbara, he was probably looking forward to setting up his own household. Uh, we know that he was hankering after a new harpsichord. Uh, so he got this... Uh, considerable amount of money from his uncle, and maybe this was a gesture in return uh, in memory of his uncle Tobias. Well, the quest for origins continues. And here we're going to talk now a little bit about the influence of Johannes Oliarius. Johannes Oliarius um, lived from about 1611 to 1684, I think, somewhere around there. He was a noted theologian in the area of Mühlhausen, Arnstadt, and, and so on. Actually worked in Weissenfels, uh, and he was uh, uh, widely published. And uh, as a matter of fact, Bach uh, owned a Bible commentary five-volume Bible commentary written by Johannes Oliarius. And uh, now in retrospect, we have discovered uh, that uh, he relied on that commentary a great deal when he was in the compositional process of dealing with the cantata texts. Johannes Oliarius also wrote a prayer book, which was called Christlichen Beit Shula, which means a uh, Christian school of prayer. And it's likely that Bach may have had a copy of that in his possession. In 1985, a Bach scholar by the name of Renata Steiger uh, took a look at that, um, that uh, Beit Shula, that book of prayers, and discovered something quite interesting. Uh, she discovered that there was a section in the prayer book called Sighs and Prayers for a Blessed End. 
and uh, the section included um, prayers that uh, were to be prayed, uh, scriptural readings that were to be read at the time of death, uh, with suggestions of hymn stanzas that could be recited uh, or sung, and uh, all of this was meant to be used at the time of death. Well, that was not an unusual or singular kind of uh, um, in, uh, uh, invention by Johannes Oliarius. It's actually part of a longer tradition, uh, which has got a Latin title. It's called, called Ars Moriendi, uh, which literally means the art of dying. And this tradition of the art of dying uh, goes back at least until the uh, latter part of the 14th century. And interestingly enough, during this time of pandemic, uh, the tradition of putting together prayers and sighs and hymn stanzas and texts uh, for a time of dying um, was prompted by the Black Plague. And we know from the Black Plague that people were left to die on their own. Sounds like today, doesn't it? And uh, even the clergy would not come near people. And so in order to help them do that dying uh, by themselves, uh, clergy began to put together these uh, collections of materials for them to use. And uh, this is the tradition in which Johannes Oliarius then formed this prayer book, or at least this section of the prayer book. Renata Steiger took a look at it and discovered that um, the central section of Cantata 106 actually is taken out of that prayer book. And uh, it would include, if the sheet is still up before you there, it would include... Uh, sections uh, 2C, I think it is, uh, yes, uh, 2C through 3B. All of that comes straight out of Oliarius. Sections 2A and 2B are in parentheses on the sheet that you're looking at, and that indicates that they were supplied by someone else. Could have been Bach himself. It uh, could have been his friend Eilmar from St. Mary's. Who knows? And then section four, the chorale, uh, probably came from Bach's own contacts with the chorales and, and uh, what he had available. So um, <clears throat> Renata Steiger's uh, proposal is that uh, this cantata is really a musical setting of Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. Uh, with uh, some uh, uh, additions to it. Uh, for instance, the final chorale, the sinfonia, and then a spattering of uh, chorale melodies and whatnot uh, that sit in the midst of the rest of the cantata. This brings a possible scenario now that sort of wraps things up a little bit. One wonders whether uh, Bach took off for Lübeck, 1705-1706, and certainly he um, came to be good friends with Buxtehude. And uh, he may, while well, he said that he was going to listen to Buxtehude play and he wanted to learn more about Buxtehude's organ playing, the fact of the matter is that Buxtehude was doing all kinds of choral work at the time too, and may have in fact enlisted Bach to sing uh, or perhaps play because he was an ex excellent violinist. And I'm sure that Bach was involved with the choral music there at St. Mary's in Lübeck, uh, as well as listening to Buxtehude play organ. At any rate, he was very interested in what Buxtehude was, was doing and how he composed. And Buxtehude may have given him an assignment, uh, or at least suggested an assignment, uh, to take something, take a prayer or some devotional material and uh, write a piece of music around it. And Bach may have started that there in Lübeck. And what we have in Cantata 106 is, is uh, the final product of what went on. There's more to support this theory. For instance, 
Uh, Books to Huda began all of his choral works, or most of his choral works, with sinfonias. So Bach would have learned that, that particular um, uh, uh, tool from him. Furthermore, Books to Huda was uh, a, a very big fan of a ground bass that is a repeating bass figure. And then he would use that, like the Pachelbel Canon, for instance. He would use that on, and write variations on top of it. Uh, this was a favorite compositional process that he had. In Cantata 106, uh, Movement 2B, uh, I think it is, uh, is built on a ground bass, and we're going to take a look at that, as is Movement 3A. Both of them are built on ground basses, uh, and they're chacons, uh, as they're called. So it's very possible that uh, Bach was putting to work a technique that Buxtehude was helping him learn how to do. Uh, I would like to think that the scenario then is that uh, this cantata was begun already, uh, at least in concept, uh, while Bach was in Lübeck, and that uh, he completed it uh, when he uh, came back to Arnstadt or when he got to Mühlhausen. And uh, when the time came for him to come up with some sort of funeral music, he had some things at hand and he could finish the product off. And uh, that's the way it, uh, it ended up. Now I would like to take a uh, closer look at uh, Buxtehude's use of chorale in the cantata itself. Um, first of all, I need to remember that uh, the hymn stanzas were part of these manuals for dying, uh, and so it would not be unusual for Bach to insert some hymn stanzas along the way uh, for use uh, of this material. Um, and I think that he was experimenting with possibilities because he uses hymn stanzas in this cantata in, in several different ways. The first one is in movement 2D, uh, the fourth part of movement 2. And there what he does is he quotes uh, a, a hymn tune, but it's done instrumentally. There's no text with it. It's just the recorders playing the tune uh, while other stuff is going on in the choir. The tune actually is Ich hab uh, mich sach Gott hereingestellt, uh, which uh, means uh, I've placed all my stuff in God's bosom or something. It's a hymn that had 18 stanzas, uh, but seven, stanzas 17, some scholars have noted, corresponded or corresponds to the thoughts that were expressed textually in uh, 2D. So it could be that that's the stanza that Bach had in mind. He uses this technique of, uh, of hauling in a hymn tune uh, as a quote in cantata literature several times. And every time uh, it causes people to say, well, which stanza of the hymn was he thinking of? And one just simply cannot answer that. So it's a bit of a problem that, that comes along with that particular technique. So that's one way. Second way, a uh, different kind of quote uh, happens in, um, let's see, which, which movement is this? In movement uh, 2D. And uh, I'm going to ask my assistant uh, to put up a page which has a big letter B on it. And... Um, uh, that's that's the example. What Bach does here, uh, you'll notice if you look at the score that the bottom three uh, voice parts are just concluding a phrase, a choir phrase, and the solo soprano then takes over with the text, ya yeah, ya, yeah, that is, yes, yes, uh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And she repeats that several times. Now, if you look at the, what the, the notes are that she sings, Ja, come, Herr Jesu, come. Ja, come, ich Herr du, come. And that's a quote from a hymn, Herzlich tut mich erlangen, 
which is a tune that we commonly associate with O Sacred Head Now Wounded. So it could have had reference to that. It could easily have reference to that. But it could also have reference to the original text, Herzlich tut mich erlangen, which in its first in its first verse ends with the words, Ja, come here, Jesu, come. So Bach may have been thinking about that text, or his mind was bumped into thinking about that text, and he just took the a piece of the hymn tune itself, quoted it, uh, and it now becomes a melodic uh, piece that he uses uh, throughout movement 2D. So not only the soprano uh, sings that little snippet, but the choir does as well later. Uh, each, each part of the choir voice uh, also sings that quote. So that's a fourth way of using um, uh, hymn stanza. Now, a fifth way happens in, um, in 3B. There, in 3B, the bass soloist is singing the text that comes from uh, Luke chapter 22, I think it is, where Jesus is on, on the cross and he turns to one of the thieves and he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Hoita, hoita, today, today. And the bass voice keeps singing that again and again and again. Um, and then uh, what happens is that the sopranos from the choir come in and sing at the same time uh, Luther's hymn, um, in peace and joy I now depart, which is a paraphrase of the Nunc Dimittis, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Uh, so all of this stuff is coming together. Uh, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace is a canticle frequently associated with funerals. Luther's paraphrase is well known. In fact, it's still in hymnals that we use today. Um, and uh, he has a soprano sing that tune while Jesus from the cross is saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. In peace and joy I now depart. It's a marvelous moment in the cantata. And uh, eventually Jesus' voice disappears from the movement and all that's left is the chorale tune. And its uh, conclusion is a masterwork and will Take a look at that in just a minute. And then finally, the fourth way that uh, Bach uses a chorale is in movement four. Uh, there he uh, takes uh, stanza seven of a chorale called In Dich Hab Ich Gehoffet uh, by Adam Reusner. It was a chorale that still was in uh, the Lutheran hymnal uh, back in the 40s and 50s, almost in its entirety. And it's a wonderful hymn about trust, and stanza seven is a doxology. Bach uh, quotes uh, pretty straightforward uh, the first part of that hymn stanza, alternating with some insertions by the instruments, but then its concluding line is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And there he breaks into a choral fugue uh, that's probably one of the most glorious moments in uh, all of Bach's literature. And we'll hear a little bit of that later if there's time. So in these four different ways, Bach is using the chorale in the midst of, of the work and uh, is, is already using a scheme and a practice that he uses throughout his composing career and that is calls upon the people's music uh, to connect the people's music to what he's inventing as, as a composer and combines the two together. I'd like to talk now just a little bit about the composer's toolbox. Um, if Bach wrote this at the age of 21, 20, 22, um, he, he's just beginning to uh, explore all of the possibilities that are available to him as a composer and as a 
uh, a student of his tradition, of the Lutheran cantor tradition. He's quite aware of all of the musical rhetoric, we call it, uh, the various kinds of devices that you can use musically to convey um, either emotions or some sort of sense of, uh, of, of upward movement or downward movement. And so there's a variety of these things uh, that appear in this cantata. I'm going to point out just a couple of them. First of all, we're not going to see this or hear any of it, but when you do listen to the cantata, listen for it. In the Sinfonia, <clears throat> uh, what you hear, first of all, is kind of predominance of lower voiced instruments. Uh, there's cello and bass down below, um, and then there's the two violas da gamba uh, stacked above that, so it's a very heavy sound. And then the recorders finally come in up above, and, and it's uh, they just sort of tinkle up there. Uh, it's a completely different sort of uh, timbre. Uh, but this, this heaviness is is combined with a steady uh, rhythm, uh, like a repeated notes, repeated eighth notes, which kind of describe an inevitability of death because uh, it just keeps repeating. Uh, and so there's a kind of a heaviness about the whole symphonia that gets you ready uh, for what is to come. So listen for that. In uh, movement uh, two, um, 2A, um, it's kind of cute. Uh, the text there is from, um, actually from the Apostle Paul, uh, who's preaching in Rome, and uh, he's talking about the unknown God, and, and he talks about, uh, in this God we move and exist and have our being. You probably remember those words. And those are pulled out for, for the text in uh, movement 2a. In German, it's in, <clears throat> excuse me, in im Leben und Weben. Weben in, in, uh, in German means to wiggle or to bounce, uh, certainly to move. And so what Bach does here is he has the voices move very quickly in eighth note patterns. Uh, it's a triple meter kind of dance thing that goes on. And there's all this uh, movement, this wiggling, this bouncing uh, that's going on uh, that he does musically. Helps us to understand that. In 2B, we've already uh, talked about his use of the chacon, the ground bass. Uh, and uh, you can see an example of that at letter A, the piece of music that has letter A, and I put brackets around the uh, uh, bass notes there uh, that uh, consist of the ground bass, just keeps getting repeated again and again and again. Um, it's at different pitch levels, but it's repeated again and again. And above that, uh, Bach does all kinds of other variations. This is a technique, as I said, that he learned from his teacher, Buxter Huda. And then in the movement 2D, which is a, a monumental movement, uh, this is about the Old Covenant. Interestingly enough, the text is from the Apocrypha, the book of Sirach, which talks about the Old Covenant. And uh, the message here is that death is due to sin. And uh, Bach does this by uh, a variety of ways. First of all, the choir is... Uh, is uh, just basically alto, tenor, and bass. Doesn't use upper voices at all. And they're all singing in very low ranges. Uh, the tessitura, as we say, is extremely low. So there's just a lot of uh, heaviness uh, that goes on. And the melodic line that he develops, uh, the third note of it to the fourth note, is a drop of a tritone. And a tritone uh, in the musical rhetoric at Bach's time, indicated uh, sinister stuff and indicated the devil, death, all, all things connected with the devil and uh, death. So you have um, uh, the tritone there and this heaviness of scoring. But the really neat thing is what Bach does at the end of this movement. And here, hopefully, you can see 
uh, piece of music uh, labeled letter C. And this is the end of this, uh, this movement, um, uh, 2D, where it comes to a conclusion. And Bach is trying to describe here in about seven measures uh, the moment of death. And I want to help you understand all of the various techniques that he uses in order to make that happen. In the uh, last measure at the top of the page, the two flute parts at the top of uh, the score uh, in that last measure start out with 16th notes in piano. So they're getting softer now and they're going to be heard much because they're dying. And then they go to a trill that lasts into the next measure. So this is a kind of a fluttering that went with death and the act of dying uh, that people experienced and that expected uh, from people who were dying. Their breathing became very um, uneven and uh, heart fluttered and, and other things like that. So that's the first thing that Bach does. Second thing that he does is that if you'll look at um, uh, the last measure at the top of the page and go to the bottom of the system, there's some Latin words down there by the bass part that says tasto solo. That means that at that point the person that's playing the keyboard stops playing harmony and plays only the basic note that's written there. And that empties out the harmony. Uh, it takes stuff away from the sound. Uh, so that's removing something from uh, the life of the piece. Third thing is that um, in measure 181, that's the same measure, you have the beginning in the bass part and in the gamba parts of this pulsating rhythm. Uh, this is the heart uh, doing its last beating and uh, it just keeps pulsating away. Uh, on a given note. Uh, fourth thing that he does is measure 181 to 182. If you look at the choir parts, uh, they're in parallel movement. Uh, they're moving upward together. So there's parallel movement upwards. And as you hear this, it's even better hearing it than, than seeing it on the page. But, but what's going on is that uh, the soul is leaving the body. It's going upwards and upwards and upwards. So that's, and that's the next thing that he does. And then measure 182 and following, you see, you look around, the instruments begin one by one to drop out. So the first gamba player plays only the first measure in the bottom system. Second gamba player plays four notes beyond that. And the uh, continual part, the cello and bass, down below that, play only four notes beyond that. So one by one they're dropping off the end of the earth. And then measures um, uh, 182, 183, same thing there. Now the instruments have gone from a dynamic of piano to a dynamic of pianissimo. So quieter and quieter and quieter uh, this act of dying is getting. And then finally, uh, not finally, but uh, next to the final, the uh, soprano voice, if you look at her part there in uh, third last measure, uh, there's all kinds of um, fluttering going on, and, and uh, this is uh, fluttering that people would hear from a dying voice. And then the final thing that Bach does, and this you can't hear, you can only see, is if you look at the final measure, there's nothing there. So you have a measure, an empty measure, and it's a, the time between death and what is to follow. This uh, um, is what we call Augen music. It's uh, eye music more than, than anything else. Um, all right, so then um, in 3B, uh, which is a movement that comes after this. But in 3B, it's the movement where um, Jesus is singing from the cross, Hoite, hoite, today, today is, uh, you will be with me in paradise. 
Uh, the word paradis, which is the German word for paradise, uh, the tessitura, the range of the bass is extremely high. It's way beyond what would be normally called for. And uh, so paradise is way above anything that we know now. And Bach is trying to say that. Um, finally, the, the last movement. Um, and this is uh, music, uh, hopefully, that my assistant can put up for you. It's labeled D. It's the final uh, movement. And you got several pages here. But I think this is worth looking at because it's kind of unusual. Uh, Bach starts with uh, the instruments playing kind of a little instrumental uh, introduction there. Uh, and the choir comes in in the second system, third measure in. But look what happens with the choir entrance. The choir entrance is on downbeats, on second and third and fourth beats. But if you look at the instruments above it, they come in on the ends of beats. So the choir is one, two, and, three, and, four, and, so the, 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 the instruments are kind of bumping up there. They're not together with the choir. And they're, they're frantically trying to run after the choir and play with the choir, and they can't quite get it together. So the whole movement is in disarray at this point. It's disjointed. And um, I think what Bach is trying to say here, uh, this is just conjecture, but... Um, this kind of hocket, it's called hocket in some places, kind of hocket effect um, se seems to indicate that that um, joining the heavenly music uh, makers uh, is not an automatic thing and you've got to get kind of get used to their rhythms. And um, um, the music that we make here and the music that's being made there is, is disjointed. Mm -hmm. It comes off disjointed now. We can't quite get it together until we get to the choral fugue, uh, which is a little farther on, several measures on. Durch Jesum Christum. And so it's through Jesus Christ, uh, good Christology again, through Jesus Christ that the choral fugue comes together and the voices and the instruments are finally together and play together to the end. So it's an interesting uh, little, little touch that he makes here at, at the end of the piece. Folks, this is such a wonderful cantata. It goes by so quickly. Uh, but enjoy every moment of it. Uh, it's, it's profoundly uh, uh, deep in its thought. Uh, you see Bach, at uh, uh, the young Bach, eagerly at work trying to make things work. You see Buxtehude looking over his shoulder. Uh, you see some very mature views of death uh, and, a, and a grappling with death uh, that's uh, so unlike what we see today in our midst. And yet with its roots in the pandemic, uh, its roots in Ars Moriendi, it's a piece that is uh, so very, very appropriate in our, in our days. Happy listening. Mm -hmm.